go to the Lord together as we open his word together today. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just pray now that you would quieten our hearts, still our minds. Lord, if there's anything troubling us, we just turn it over to you right now and just ask that you'd give us your peace and your uh, an awareness of your presence with us. Speak to our hearts today, we pray. In your precious name we ask. Amen. Well, today is Pentecost Sunday when we remember the coming of the Holy Spirit. But this wasn't the first time that the Holy Spirit was active in our world. Genesis 1, 1 tells us that he was there at creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Then 1 Samuel 16.13 tells us that the prophet Samuel anointed David to be king of Israel and from that day on the Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. In the ministry of Jesus we also see a special anointing of the Holy Spirit for ministry. Luke 4 verse 1 says, Jesus full of the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. And then in Luke 4, 14, we read, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. So we can see that the Holy Spirit had been active in the world long before Pentecost. What was different, though, about that day was that the Holy Spirit was given to all believers for all time. This wasn't now an occasional anointing for a specific purpose as it had been in the past. It was now a permanent gift and promise for all Christians everywhere. Towards the end of his life on earth, Jesus often spoke to his disciples about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And when he did, he always spoke with enthusiasm and joy. In John 14, 25, he said, All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Jesus knew that it was in our best interest that he returned to the Father so that the Holy Spirit could come to us. In John 16, 25, he said, It is for your good that I go away. Unless I go, the counsellor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. In Acts 1, verses 4 and 8, Jesus told his followers, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit was God's promised gift for all believers. Now we all enjoy receiving gifts on special occasions like birthdays and Christmas, don't we? But the most precious gifts are given to us by people who know us the best and know what we really need. The Holy Spirit was the gift that the early Christians really needed and he's the gift that we today really need as well. He is the gift of God to all believers. So today we're going to look at three specific ways in which the Holy Spirit is God's gift to us. First of all, he's the gift of God's power. Jesus knew that he was leaving his followers a huge task in this world to carry on the ministry that he had begun. It was a job that, that they and we couldn't possibly do in our own strength. Jesus knew that and made provision for our need through this special gift of God's power. He doesn't expect us to serve him in our own strength. We can't. But through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can do all things through Christ. 
On the day of Pentecost, there were three major indications of God's power at work. The first was a sound. A very loud, sudden noise came straight from heaven and filled the whole house where the believers were gathered. This sound reminded them of a mighty rushing wind. Now wind is one of the biblical symbols for the Holy Spirit. The disciples instantly recognised that this was no ordinary wind, but rather a powerful force coming straight from heaven itself. They recognised that God was at work. Because they were expecting God to send the Holy Spirit, and because their hearts were in an attitude of prayer, no one was afraid. They were just watching and waiting expectantly to see what God would do next. The fact that the sound that they heard reminded them of a powerful wind is quite significant. In both Hebrew and Greek, there's a single word for wind and spirit. In Hebrew, it's ruach. In Greek, it's neuma. And we get our English word pneumatic from that, like the pneumatic drill, which also makes a very loud noise. Uh, so there was already a close association in people's minds between wind and spirit. The one made them think of the other. In John 3, 8, Jesus used the image of the wind to describe the work of the Holy Spirit. He said to Nicodemus, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So for the believers on the day of Pentecost, familiar as they were with Hebrew and Greek and waiting expectantly on the Lord, the wind-like roar that they heard was a clear indication that the Holy Spirit had come. And then following the great sound from heaven, the second indication of the Spirit's arrival was a great sight. What looked like flames of fire separated and came to rest on each individual believer. This was especially meaningful in that the Holy Spirit was not just a gift for the church as a whole, but also a gift for each believer individually. Just like the wind, fire is another biblical symbol for the Holy Spirit. When God called Moses to be his chosen servant to free the children of Israel from slavery in Egypt, he used flames of fire to get his attention. God spoke to Moses from a bush that looked as if it was ablaze, but didn't burn up. Both at the burning bush and on the day of Pentecost, fire was a symbol for the Holy Spirit and a great reminder of the power of God. When it's under control, fire has a great power to transform. If you take ordinary sand and heat it in a furnace, to 1700 degrees centigrade, you get molten glass, which can then be blown or shaped into many forms. When it cools, it doesn't go back to being ordinary, opaque sand ever again. It's been changed forever into a brand new, transparent, shiny substance that we know as glass. When God called Moses at the burning bush, he transformed him from a fearful runaway from Egypt into a mighty servant who would stand up to Pharaoh and eventually lead God's people out of Egypt through the wilderness to the promised land. On the day of Pentecost, God transformed the believers from fearful followers into daring disciples. After the death of Jesus, they'd locked themselves away in an upper room behind closed doors, scared to death of the Jews. But on the day of Pentecost, in the power of the Holy Spirit, they went out into the open and preached the gospel without fear to everyone. Along with the sound of the mighty wind and the sight of the tongues of fire, there was a third indication as well of God's power at work through the Holy Spirit. And that was the sign of fulfilled prophecy. In Joel 2, 28-29, God had foretold, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. 
Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And everyone who believes in the name of the Lord will be saved. On the day of Pentecost, the disciples went out among the huge crowds who'd gathered from all parts of the world to celebrate this important Jewish festival. Jesus had told the disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel. But on this day, the Lord brought the world to them. There in Jerusalem were people from all parts of the known world at that time who didn't understand the local languages. Yet God enabled the apostles to declare his wonders in tongues that they'd never learned. And in this way, everyone was able to hear the good news of the gospel in their own language. It was a miracle and was only possible because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And then Peter stood up to preach and the power of the Lord was seen again in the Holy Spirit's work of convicting people of their sin and their need for a saviour. As the crowd listened to the gospel, the hearts of thousands were stirred and they asked the disciples, what shall we do? And Peter told them, repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And the response was nothing short of another miracle, as at least 3,000 people came to a personal faith in the Lord Jesus and were baptised. God's promise through the prophet Joel had been fulfilled. This was a clear sign that the Holy Spirit had come and had revealed himself in great power. So on the day of Pentecost, there was a great sound, a great sight and a great sign, all indications of the coming of the Holy Spirit, the gift of God's power. You'll remember that when Jesus told his disciples that he would soon be leaving them, they felt really sad and bereft. For three years they'd spent every waking hour with him, listening to him teach, learning from his example, putting into practice the lessons he taught them. What would they do after he left them? Who would they talk to when they had a problem? Who would guide them when they needed advice? God made provision for that need too, because the Holy Spirit is not just the gift of God's power. He's also the gift of God's presence. Through his Spirit, God is with us at all times and in all places. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, he promised his followers, Surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. And this was made possible by the coming of the Holy Spirit. God knew what was best for us. Jesus, in his somewhat limited human form, could only be in one place at one time. But now through the person of the Holy Spirit, he can be in all places, at all times, all at once. It really is wonderful. And you know, something similar has happened with our church because of the pandemic. In the old days, if you'd wanted to join us in worship at the International Christian Fellowship, and you would have needed to be in Portimao, Portugal, at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning in our church building. But now, thanks to modern technology and the grace of God, you can worship with our church family <clears throat> in any place, on any day, at any time. This week, people will be joining us at various times, uh, on various days in various countries, in Canada, America, UK, Holland, Germany, Russia, Australia, New Zealand, as well as here in Portugal. The technology is remarkable and is something that we could never have imagined years ago. But it reminds me of the way that the Holy Spirit works, breaking down all barriers of time and space so that he can be with us all the time, wherever we are. 
He never leaves us. He's our comforter, our counsellor, our guide, our friend, always by our side to help us and intercede for us. Hebrews 13 verse 5 assures us of God's promise, Never will I leave you or forsake you. So through the Holy Spirit, God is always with us and we are never alone. We can always talk to him. We can always listen to him. We can always enjoy his sweet company. He is the best friend we will ever have. He is the gift of God's presence. And then along with the gift of God's power and the gift of God's presence, the Holy Spirit is also the gift of God's personality. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 tells us the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Amazing as it may sound, little by little God is making us, his children, to be more like him. Through his Holy Spirit in us, he's developing in us something of his personality. Just as children take after their human parents, so God's children take on some of the characteristics of their heavenly father. This isn't to our credit at all, but it's something that the Holy Spirit does as he makes his home in our hearts. Scientists tell us that the moon doesn't produce any light of its own, but simply reflects the light of the sun. And that's rather like us. Of ourselves, we are not good, kind, loving people. But when we have the Lord Jesus living in us through his Holy Spirit, by God's grace, we begin to reflect his personality. And so if people see any goodness or kindness or love in us, it's simply a reflection of the Lord Jesus. It's God in us. Jesus is the light. We are just the reflectors. The moon only shines because its surface reflects light from the sun. And although sometimes it might seem to shine quite brightly, the moon in fact only reflects between 3 and 12 percent of the sunlight that hits it. Well, we're not always good reflectors either. It's interesting that the apparent brightness of the moon as seen from Earth depends on where the moon is in its orbit around our planet. And in a similar way, our brightness for the Lord depends on where we are in our spiritual journey with him. If we will just yield our will to his, And let him be Lord of our lives, guiding our thoughts, our actions, our words, our steps. Then we will be better reflectors and will shine more brightly for him as we become more like him. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the gift of God's personality. And so today, if you feel that you just don't have the strength to do the things that God wants you to do, remember that the Holy Spirit is the gift of God's power. Or today, if you're feeling a bit lonely, remember that the Holy Spirit is the gift of God's presence. Or if you're wondering what God is doing in your life, remember that the Holy Spirit is the gift of God's personality. Through all the trials and tribulations, he's making you more like him. So in the person of the Holy Spirit, God has given us a wonderful gift. The gift of his power as we serve him. The gift of his presence as we walk with him. 
and the gift of his personality as we become more like him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you today for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Lord, you knew just what we needed. You knew, Lord, that we would need power in our lives. You knew that on our own we are not strong enough to do what you want us to do and live the way you want us to. We need your strength, your power. So thank you, Lord, for sending us the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we thank you that the Holy Spirit is the gift of your presence. Thank you that you are always with us, that you never leave us or forsake us, that there's not a single hour of the day or night when we're completely alone because you are always with us. And because of that, we can always turn to you and bring our needs to you and you will always listen to us and care for us. So thank you, Lord, that you are the gift of God's presence. And Lord, we thank you that the Holy Spirit is the gift of God's personality. Thank you, Lord, that little by little, through all the ups and downs of life, you are making us more like you. Thank you, Lord, that you use all the trials and tribulations for good in the end to make us more like you. And so, Lord, we give you thanks today for sending the Holy Spirit. Thank you that he's always with us and never leaves us or forsakes us. Thank you, Lord. We praise you and we love you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.